in California. So, and my, the title of my presentation is Implementing Problem Solving in Remote uh, or Online Science Classes. And um, let's get to it. Uh, and I did, uh, we, uh, Michelle and I uh, talked, she's our host today, and we're going to take questions at the end. Um, so please hold your questions, although I'm very much interested in uh, this becoming a workshop and a discussion. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, I'm the first one to say that I am not an expert in um, these things, in, in doing problem solving and in uh, pedagogy, and there's always things that I can learn and I'm looking to learn. So please, uh, anything you can add to this, I will be looking uh, for uh, help at the end. But, uh, so what I'm gonna talk about is um, sort of my forays into how to turn a chemistry class, a science class, into um, from face-to-face -to, -face to online. And uh, when I was doing this, it really occurred to me that what I'm really trying to do is as much as possible emulate what I do in class online, although there are some uh, pros to being online, I think, uh, and definitely some cons. And uh, one of the toughest nuts to crack, I think, was uh, how to uh, do problem solving in a remote or an online class. <clears throat> and because uh, problem solving takes many forms and it's important for students to do it and it's important for teachers to see it. Uh, and uh, two sort of big things that I like to do when I see my students work is to help them correct mistakes. And uh, one thing that's more an issue when the online and remote environment is uh, to make sure students are doing their own work. And uh, one of the assumptions I take into any class, and this is even true when classes were face-to-face, -face, is that if you give them an assignment, uh, many students will Google uh, your exact problem to find out what the answer is for uh, help and to you know, uh, write down the answer sometimes as well. So um, anyway, there's, there's always a lot going on in our minds as we think about um, classes. And so uh, these were things going on in my mind. Uh, brief uh, uh, slide about how my courses were before the pandemic and before we went online. So I have uh, four, uh, in general, in chemistry classes, there are four unit classes with three hours of lecture time and um, which I present a lecture uh, with a skeleton lecture note handout that the students fill in. Um, students ask questions, uh, pretty typical homework. Um, after lecture, they go home and use their notes in the textbook and Khan Academy and Google and everything. And I encourage that. Uh, I encourage collaboration from my students um, and to find out how to learn the material in the best possible way. Recitation, so after they do the homework, usually they come back the following week and we work more advanced problems. And then of course there's lab and we are blessed in the sciences with lab and uh, many disciplines are, <clears throat> um, but uh, it's really a chance for students to do hands-on exploration and develop skills. Now my course is now, so I've flipped my lecture, meaning that students will watch lectures in smaller chunks before they come to class. Then as far as homework, uh, I do that uh, during lecture time, in which case I work on original uh, pool-based homework problems. That means that each question that a student gets is from a pool, quote unquote, of anywhere uh, from uh, one to two questions. Sometimes my pools are very shallow, uh, but uh, oftentimes they are 50 to 100 questions, uh, different by the numbers, sometimes different by the reaction. Uh, and then uh, a lot of those, will, uh, I'll talk about this more, are uh, number-based. And um, But some of them, and this is important and why I'm talking about this today, is I also use the file upload option where they have to upload either a picture or a PDF of their work. And that's really where the problem solving, I get, I get to see it. Recitation, uh, I'm, uh, this is the, where, this pre where I got the idea to do this today, is just uh, the students document their work via video and the videos are uh, amazing. Um, I'm so pleased with this. Uh, and I will show you some of the videos in a little bit. 
And then lab, uh, I'm very happy to say that at least in my Chem 2000 class, that the students, even though they're at home, are still doing uh, hands-on explorations uh, in which they're developing skills uh, that they would use in class. And so I'll go through sort of uh, homework, then recitation, then lab, and my attempts at um, implementing problem solving. Now let's start with the homework. So over the summer, uh, since we knew this was coming, uh, I took the time to uh, develop original homework pools. Uh, I could not have done it without my uh, colleague in the chemistry, uh, uh, chemistry colleague, Ray Richards. He gave us an excellent tutorial on how to use Excel to create homework pools. Uh, if you've uh, used uh, the uh, a test function in, uh, to do your homework in a Blackboard, you know that NUM are what are calculated numeric uh, questions that your students will do. Uh, that's what I have most of, but I also have many FIL or file upload problems. And then a couple of multiple choice, some uh, FIB, some fill in the blank, some FIB plus, which are multiple fill in the blanks, and then some uh, multiple answer, that's MA. And uh, so there are so many different types of problems that we can do. Um, and so I've tried to take advantage of each of them where appropriate. Now uh, let's go to some examples. So this is a file response where I am gonna show you not only the question, um, which is a very bread and butter question as I'll tell my students, uh, how many moles and molecules using Avogadro's number are there in a certain number of grams of dinitrogen uh, tetroxide. Um, this and then uh, they have to upload their work. Please show your work. Please submit your work as a PDF file, uh, although some students upload them as uh, JPEGs as well. Uh, but here is an example of the work that I get to see uh, for this homework assignment. And you can see they've written out the question. They've written out their answer. I can see uh, in chemistry, what we call the significant figures, I can see everything and um, even their units, uh, which is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of units myself. I have a shirt that says, uh, I heart units. Uh, so, um, and this is the work of uh, my student Manal this semester. And I also should say that I have um, a similar problem, which is numeric, meaning they only put in the answer. Uh, and uh, I let my students do the each homework question, each test in Blackboard as many times as they'd like until they get it right. Uh, so uh, what else was I gonna say? Oh, so each student gets a different number of grams of uh, dinitrogen tetroxide. So they're different, but they're all related. And I encourage them to work together and then solve it for their own set of numbers. Now here's a more complex problem. A sample of a powder was found at a crime scene, uh, and it's you know it's, it's a long problem, and I'd like to show you what it looks like. Uh, in uh, an answer, looks like uh, this is Adalia's work, and uh, it's a full uh, it's a full page of work to get the answer. And if this were just a problem in which they put in a number, I wouldn't get to see what's going on with this problem. For example. Here we have that the uh, molar mass of carbon dioxide should be 44.01. So I get to uh, type in a comment about that. Um, here, uh, the uh, unit conversion factor is upside down and it should have two moles of hydrogen. And both of those affect their final answer, specifically in the number of oxygens that they get for this problem. And so what I'm really trying to show here is that the, I, can, I can see their work and I can help them uh, if there's any issues with it and correct future mistakes uh, before the exam. And I don't know if you noticed, but this whole problem is worth one point in the homework and it might be an eight or 10 point problem on the exam. Okay. And those are a couple examples of the file upload portion uh, of the homework. Oh. Um, shoot, <laughs> uh, I was playing around with the highlighter function here and I guess my highlighter didn't leave. Um, anyway, so there's my highlighter function. I, uh, well, anyway, there it is. 
Um, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to show one of the recitation videos. So I wonder if I can, um, oh, what's a race? There we go. <laughs> anyway, that'll teach me to try new things right before uh, I do my presentation. Anyway, um, oh, so now let me go back to pointer options and oh, there we go. So uh, what I'd like to do now is show uh, the first recitation video. This is by Kiara, uh, one of my Chem 1010 students. And uh, she had a problem to take a product and determine the concentration of that product. And so without further ado, and I think I have to turn this one up on my end. Okay, so the item I chose was my wash. And the ingredient I chose was ethanol. And it says that ethanol has a volume percent of, in this mouthwash, ethanol has a volume percent of 21.6%. So I took the volume percent, which is 21.6, and that means that there's 21.6 milliliters of ethanol per 100 milliliters of solution. So since the bottle is 500 milliliters, I just multiplied that by five and I got the milliliters of ethanol that were in the bottle, which is 108. Um, I took the, I took those milliliters and I used the density of ethanol, which is 0 0.789 grams. And um, just wanna jump in here. There was one mistake. Uh, this word solvent right here uh, should be solution. And so, uh, but she said solution, which was nice. So I get to hear her talk through the work that she's doing. And uh, I, I hope you could hear that. Uh, this is one of the quieter videos uh, as far as volume. And one of the issues you run into is that everybody's recording them in their own way. Um, one thing I will say is I never require my students to show their faces or their environment uh, in my class. And so this is a, a person who, uh, but I do require them to show their work. And uh, actually I don't require them to use their voice either. Um, and if that's an issue, although I will say all of my students except one this semester are using their voices on their videos to describe it. Uh, but I do have one student who uh, writes out and types out all of the work as they go through as their description of their process, because they do have to have a description of their process. Um, and I think that's that's important for me for when they turn these in. So um, so there's one, and this one was is sort of of the style where someone will uh, write out the work ahead of time and then uh, go ahead and describe it and, and basically point at it while they describe it. Um, and that's generally how they do it. Uh, there's a bunch of different styles, though, and so I'll go on to the next one here. Um, in this particular problem, uh, well, uh, this one speaks for itself, I think. So let me go ahead and start it. Oh, no, just, Oop, let me I'm start at the beginning. Percent. Okay, good morning, guys. Good morning. Once again, this is Butcher Kenny. I'm a student at Queen George's Community College, majoring in Associate Degree of Science with focus in Mechanical Engineering. So today, we're going to start an exercise in Chemistry 2000. Um, yeah, so let me just go ahead and share my screen so we guys can see the exercise and then see uh, how to solve it. So, okay. Yeah. So like I said, uh, this is chemistry 2000. So this is an, an exercise for empirical formula and combustion analysis. So this exercise, in, they want they say a particular brand of beef jerky contains 0.0552% of so, sodium nitrate, NaNO2, uh, by mass and is. I'll stop right there. Uh, so you saw uh, Butrell's uh, introduction. This was his first recitation um, problem that he solved. So, and I, I didn't, I didn't tell them that they had to introduce themselves. Uh, uh, a significant percentage of students did, although most did not. Uh, but one of the things I'll say is it's, um, as I'm grading these, 
So there's a number of students who always do some sort of nice introduction. They say hi to me. Um, they introduce themselves or, or they say, you know, uh, I really struggled with this one or I really understand it better now. Um, again, and, and then, so I'm gonna jump ahead here to I think 655, right around there. We'll play the when end. I plug in over here was 69. That, that was an explanation for that one. So thank you guys for watching this. Um, please feel free to contact me if you guys have any question, I will go ahead and explain it. So for me, I think this one is a simple way to solve this problem just by using formulas. So those are formulas and then you just have to plug in and solve your problem. Thank you guys. Thank you. This was Botrell. See you next time. Uh, yeah, no, so just a, a really, in my opinion, well done demonstrate or uh, video solution to this problem. Uh, let me show the next one now. Um, this is Yuna's work. Uh, I still have to talk to Yuna about how she prints on her notebook paper, uh, which I like, but, um, and she printed this problem. Let me play a little bit of the video. Find the concentration or the molarity of table sugar that is in a can of Coca-Cola. We first determine the molar mass of table sugar, C12H22O11, by multiplying the mass of carbon times how many carbons there are. Uh, I hope you can hear that. I, I, it is a little, it's a little uh, low even on my end, but hopefully you can hear that. Um, and again, we have, you can really see the problem solving and you can hear the description and the understanding of it. And I would suggest that it's helpful on both sides because I can see it and they're actually doing it. Um, and- uh, um. Bill, I have, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so do you give the student detailed information about how to upload, create, edit, give them access to um, certain things? I, I have students who don't know how to make a screenshot on, on their computer and uh, they and so uh, if I give them something with a screenshot, then they're taking pictures of their screen and everything's blurry. And um, I'm trying, like, do you have something where you, you give them an introduction of how to even make a video and upload it? Because I don't think my students would know how, or I'd have to give a detailed information on how to do it. Yeah, no, so that's a great question, um, Lorraine. And what I'll say is, um, uh, so yes, I do have sort of, uh, you know, uh, from the, um, the course that we took, um, they told me that I should have a how-to in Blackboard section. And I did put um, how to uh, do, how to upload videos um, and how to take um, screenshots. In fact, one of mine is about how to use the Adobe Scan app for file uploads. Um, and then of course, since this is uh, my first semester doing this, there was definitely a learning curve on all of our ends. And so the first couple, I would say, uh, at least for the, the Chem 1010 and the Chem 2000 students, that um, 80 plus percent, and I know this is anecdotal, but there were, there were many fewer problems than there were like successes. So, uh, but there were some problems. And um, uh, one of the things that I was gonna say at the end of the presentation that I learned is that almost everybody has a YouTube account and that uploading videos to YouTube and then having them send me the link or uh, cut and paste the link into Blackboard when they uh, turn it in, that was their, what they turn in. Um, it, that's, that's almost, that's what I highly recommend now for the videos. Uh, I honestly don't think that a lot of my students do have a YouTube account. Uh, they have a Gmail account, but yes. I, well, so if you have a Gmail account, you have a YouTube. Account. I, I know, but I, I, I guess it would be um, mostly. I would be concerned that my. So we'd have to also help the students to create and upload because I know how to do that, but <laughs> uh, my students struggle sometimes with technology, even if it's just take a screenshot. So um, yeah, I guess. Uh, 
I, I like this idea. I'm just, um, I'm not sure that some of my students would be able to do this. Well, and or would be some of my students might not actually be willing to do it in the way that you have it set up. Totally get that, Lorraine. And so, I mean, that's that's um, what I might say is that I think uh, you might shoot for like just the file uploads, or you know, take. Uh, I think certainly if um, if this was a different class, that um, I might. Um, just shoot for one of these as far as, and then, but what I have found, I mean, everybody's got a phone, everybody is familiar with taking pictures and then, and Blackboard surprisingly um, is pretty easy. Again, there's a learning curve to, to get the, the information into Blackboard, um, but uh, yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, this, is, this is not for everybody and there's definitely a learning curve for you, for me, and for the students. So, yeah. Um, but I will say this: on the hopeful side, I, I for my classes, I've got them all doing it enough so that I even had a video portion of their first exam, and a video portion of their second exam, where I take one of these, I give them an extended, like a, one of the longer problems, and. And so, and I've had no uh, blowback about it. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, but I mean, uh, and I'm happy. So let me let me do some more presentation. I can talk more about how I do exams. That's not part of this presentation, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so yeah, it's um, no, it's it's the baby steps. I think sometimes is uh, necessary. Uh, this was Yuna's work, so I have uh, one more. Let's show this one. Hello, my name is Fazumana Sonogo, and this is recitation number seven, I believe. Uh, currently, my problem is problem number three, the energy required to move an electron from one level to another in any one electron. Let's see. Thank you. So uh, Fazumana is showing uh, my assignment as I give it to him. So I give it to him as a PDF. And then uh, let me show a bit here. Sorry for the delay. As you can see for part, uh, let me move that. Part 3A, we have helium in, helium in the gas phase. And for that, the... <laughs> Let me skip ahead again because he goes back to the, the problem diagram here, which I copied on to my work, which you'll see right about now. All right, B. So, as the problem already stated, and let me show just the very end. Uh, Fazumana 1251 minus 2372.3, which brings us to negative. 7,623 is which will we get for helium 1s2 kilojoules per mole. Thank you and have a good day. Uh, yeah, and so you can see this is for my Chem 2000 class, which um, I have to say they are, uh, they get very involved problems uh, and they've already had calculus by the time they get to me. So uh, they're relatively techno technologically advanced, I would say, in general. So, um, yeah, so I think, um, but this is just to show you sort of what work does and can look like. Um, so, anyway, so there's, there's a fourth example. Uh, and you really can uh, sh uh, see the process involved here, which, again, is, is what I'd like to suggest is the real, like, I mean, I could actually uh, watch these uh, videos all day and uh, because they're just, it's really, uh, really nice to see the work and the effort uh, that the students can put in. Um, okay, so that was my, so now we've done homework. Now we've done a recitation, uh, what I do for um, implementing problem solving. And now I'll do a little bit about uh, labs. And this is, again, this is specifically for my Chem 2000 students, and with the help and support of my colleagues uh, at PGCC, 
I have what's called an at-home lab kit in which my students do the six labs that I'm showing right here. Uh, they learn 40 plus skills that they would do approximately equivalent or equivalent to what they would do in a face-to-face -face lab and all using uh, salt, vinegar, baking powder, and uh, di distilled or tap water, either one works. Um, and you can see I've got uh, a pH probe and uh, a TDS, which is total dissolved solids probe that also measures temperature. And we use it almost exclusively, or we do use it exclusively for temperature, although it gives me some possibilities for future experiments. Um, and the workhorse right here is the scale that uh, measures 200 grams uh, and has two decimal places, which uh, for those of you uh, scientists at home does give you up to five sig figs, depending upon how you do your measurements. Um, and then we've got some uh, plastic wear over here. The other workhorse is the plastic pipettes, as well as the rest of the beakers and graduated cylinders. Um, and, uh, oh, so I'm showing uh, details now about experiment number three in particular. It says, I list the materials that you need to complete the experiment. I've got a video showing all these materials as well for them to watch before they come to class. Uh, you can see they need a temperature probe, a, the scale, and uh, distilled water and salt, and of course, a bunch of uh, plastic wear. And then I'd like to show you the different uh, skills that they learn in this lab. And I will say that as I made this shift to developing this at-home lab kit, it was really important to me that I clearly enunciate and tell everybody that um, uh, what we're doing here. And uh, yeah, you can see I was playing with my eraser again there. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, and anyway, so here are some of the skills. You can see each of these skills has a video that I made over the summer uh, to um, show some of them anyway, not all of them. The one with asterisks have videos from previous labs. And these are the top one. These are the first uh, six or eight. There are six or eight more, including graphing by hand and graphing using Excel. Uh, and then I just like to show one example of the data that the students produce. So uh, this is Daryl's data. They're actually uh, forming a solution right here and then diluting the solution. So they get to do calculations on page two for both of those. They do it for five grams approximately of salt um, and then three and a half grams and then they dilute each of those. So they end up with four data points. Uh, I also have them, uh, in this one, they were required to uh, post a picture as part of their lab write-up of the meniscus uh, at the 50 milliliter mark um, to uh, show that they knew where their meniscus was and they were using their graduated cylinder properly. Uh, and then here's the graphs of that data. And um, I have them do graphs by hand. This is, it's a little faint, I know, it's molarity versus density and percent composition versus density for uh, salt solutions, uh, sodium chloride solutions. Then I have them do it in Microsoft Excel. And uh, anyway, so again, this is, this is, I'll backtrack here a second. Uh, you can see some problem solving down here. You can see the level of the problem solving that we do. And uh, for the labs, I will say the labs that I'm running are synchronous, meaning we do the labs together. And for example, for this lab, uh, we did the five gram sample. Uh, I did it, they did it to get their own numbers. And then I, uh, for the rest of the lab, they did the 3.5 gram sample. And then if they had any questions, I helped them through it and through their calculations. So that's how we do this. Um, let's see, data, data. Now, uh, getting towards the end here, the conclusions, the upsides to doing this, uh, you can see your students solve problems in their own handwriting and hear their voices uh, describe problem solving. And so two uh, main examples, file upload problems and uh, the videos that they make for recitation. Um, the lab, uh, the students are learning lab skills. So they are calibrating 
they are measuring, they are making diluting solutions. Um, and uh, as a bonus that I didn't think about before all this, the students are practicing presentation skills. They're using their voices to describe their work. Now, of course, there's a downside and the downside is grading, grading and more grading. And um, because it takes time to look through all of this problem solving, uh, I would say it is generally very worth it. Uh, the videos too, they're the, the most time intensive. Uh, however, they're uh, so nice to watch. Uh, so it, it gives me hope for humanity to watch those videos, I will say. Lessons learned. Um, well, uh, some weeks, I will say this semester, I've done up to five file uploads, and I think I'll back off that uh, because, again, they're pretty time consuming to grade. Um, I have some pools for my question pools for the homework that are up to 100 questions, and I would say I think that's more than you really need. I think 25 or even 15 are enough because you want enough that each student gets different problems. Uh, but not enough that you're kind of figuring out, well, which numbers are they using um, for, to solve the problem? And so that would make it a little easier to grade. Um, here's a big one. Download the files and the videos. So while I'm grading, uh, during the morning when Blackboard is speedy. <laughs> uh, and uh, this goes from when I upload my videos of lectures to, especially at the beginning of the semester, around 5 p.m., uh, I could take an hour to do what could take uh, three or four minutes in the morning. Uh, number four, uh, this is what I was talking about, have students upload their videos to YouTube and then view them in YouTube. YouTube is always fast and YouTube shrinks the videos by a factor of about 10 from what the students upload and, and from what I upload as well. And so actually when I upload a video of my lecture to Blackboard, uh, I do two things now. One, I, I upload it to YouTube, download the product, and then upload that to Blackboard. And then I also, uh, at my students' request, uh, always post a YouTube link because they've had trouble even getting those smaller uh, videos to run in Blackboard. So I have both of those options probably from uh, about week three uh, the first couple of weeks, I'll have to go back and do next semester. Uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, watching my presentation. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all my students, uh, specifically. Um, so all of them, they've really um, uh, been kind in going through this process as we figure all this stuff out. Um, and specifically the students that allowed me to share their work. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, doctors Michelle Dykus, Tanya Atkins, and Devon Stewart, who uh, helped me and worked with me uh, at my former college, Sacramento City College, to develop these materials. And Ray Richards, again, it was this huge for the uh, homework pools and his help. Uh, and Ray uh, teaches chemistry here at PGCC, as many of you know. To my chemistry colleagues, uh, the Natural Sciences Department STEM Division, PGCC for supporting our students, including purchasing the at-home lab kits. And uh, because uh, one thing I didn't mention, uh, we purchased the lab kits and then mailed them to our students. And uh, Freeba, Chase, James, Nagin, and Adrian were huge in getting the kits to the students, getting the kits, purchasing them, and then packing them up and mailing to them, them to the students. And so I'd like to thank all of these people and one final time, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions. So Bill, hi Bill, it's Michelle. So we do have some questions in the chat. So um, I will go ahead and read those questions off to you um, so we can, we can start there. And if anyone else um, have any questions after we complete the ones in the chat, um, we can take you off mute and you can feel free to ask. So Lorraine Clark, um, wants to know, do you teach the students how to create slash upload proper videos? Um, she has trouble with students not even knowing how to take a screenshot. Yeah, no. I think that was mostly answered um, already in, when we were chatting earlier, so. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, Ted Herman, uh, he teaches math and would love to see how he can have his students able, can a, be able to send 
him their homework to verify the fact they are learning? Yeah, I mean, so um, no, I think that's, I, I think it's uh, great to, to see the work as they do it. Um, and I mean, I think another thing, so it gives the students more ownership too. And you can, if you wish, give, so I think in one of the problems I showed that I was giving the student partial credit for the work. So when you see the work, it is time consuming, but if you do it, you can um, award partial credit as well. And one of the things I've implemented on my second exam in particular for my Chem 1010 class is uh, any problem that's 10 points or more, uh, I will tell them that I will go back and look at their exam submissions and award partial credit. Um, and they've been very happy with that, as you might imagine. Um, so, and it will really, and so uh, as far as exams, uh, my exams are all within Blackboard. And then I have them within 30 minutes of finishing their exam, uh, they have to upload a PDF of their work. So yeah. anyway, so that's a little bit more about the exams. Uh, any more questions, Michelle? Hopefully that was helpful. Um, so um, Bill Boyle wants to know if he can get a copy of your PowerPoint. Uh, of course, uh, Bill. And uh, yeah, so anybody, uh, my email is millerww at pgcc.edu. Uh, and if you email me, I'd be happy to share this presentation. So Ted Herman has a couple other questions. So one was, what platform are you working in to create the videos or the students? And then can you show how your students actually upload their files? Um, good question. So um, for the students, um, well, let's see. So let me stop sharing. It might take me a minute here. Um, and so uh, let's see, Blackboard. Sorry, I have to open up my Blackboard here. Um, let's see, how can I do this while protecting privacy? Um, so I guess let me just describe it. Um, uh, the, the way the students do it is varied, um, but again, most of them at this point uh, upload, let's see, most of them at this point upload their files to YouTube and then uh, send me a link uh, to YouTube. And so I'm watching most of their videos in YouTube right now. Uh, and that was something that I did not tell them. So I gave them instructions at the beginning of the semester. Uh, and I'm happy to share those too, if you email me uh, uh, with, about how to upload their files to Blackboard, because I thought that would be the easiest way to do it. Um, but again, if you've got a bunch of students, so trying to upload videos at 11.55 p.m., when it's due at 11.59, uh, they do run into problems sometimes and it does take them a little while to do it. Um, so, uh, but I'm happy to share those, what I, what I have as instructions. And um, although I think a number of students, a number of students still do upload their files actually, um, but a number of students also uh, send me YouTube links. And I've really just let them work it out. I mean, I, I think at least for my students, and this is just my experience, but they're pretty savvy. I mean, in the age of TikTok and um, uh, all the video sharing platforms that I don't even know because I'm too old to use them, um, they, uh, they're pretty sad. They're, they're, they may be savvier than we, we know. Um, anyway, and, and I, I know I took a chance in having them do this, but I also uh, worked with them, any students that needed it, uh, extended deadlines for the first one in particular, and uh, and they have responded. I'm happy to say, which I know I may not have uh, answered your question, but um, hopefully that was a taste, and and we can talk and uh, more after this presentation as well. So the last question is: Do you limit the time for the uh, the videos? Is there a time limit put on that? Um, good question. So no, um, and some of them uh, have been up to 10 minutes. Oh, and so this is uh, another lesson learned. Um, so uh, after the first couple, I have learned how ju to judiciously watch videos, meaning that 
Uh, I will always watch the very beginning because oftentimes they say hi to me and uh, I will sometimes write a comment back to them. Um, and then uh, I look at the work and I will skip through the video to see and make sure that they're describing everything and they've got everything correct. And then I'll watch the very end. Um, so I don't, I've learned to not necessarily watch all of each video. Um, and then as I skip through, if I see anything that looks like a problem, I will watch that portion. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, no, no time limits though. And they're pretty self uh, time limiting most students. And most students have their work written out and then they point their way through it as they describe it. Um, I don't know, there's, there's, it's part of the heartwarming aspect of the videos is watching how they end up solving the problem. And I hope I've shown you a couple of them. One, one I didn't, uh, Butchrell, he actually did a separate video in which he actually, for one of the problems, he on the back of the door in his room, put up a piece of butcher paper and solved it there. And I didn't use that one because it was a little grainy to see unless you knew what the problem was. But students, they've come up with many different ways to do it. Now they've settled in and basically each have their own approach. Um, yeah, but no time limits. And uh, how many students do you have in this recitation portion? Um, I'm thinking about timing and you know, with like 70 students, it may not be doable. Yeah, so um, I, uh, this semester, I have a 24 student section of Chem 1010, uh, which is also the lecture. And I have for um, Chem 2000, I have 16 students. So number, yeah, so it's classes are small uh, in this. Uh, and I think I have had up to 48 students in a class and done this. Um, um, and it is, it is time consuming. Another option, um, I've actually uh, taken a week off doing the videos <laughs> uh, so that I can catch up. Um, so I don't think, uh, I don't think it has to be all or none either. Um, but uh, I definitely think too though, that uh, there is something to doing the first couple and getting them into the saddle. And then now, I mean, I haven't had a question about how to upload a video in uh, four or five weeks. So uh, they definitely have figured out how to do it. So Bill, there are no more questions um, in the chat. Um, just a couple comments. Great presentation, great job. So yeah. thank you. I don't know if, if anyone else has any um, other questions um, for Bill. Feel free to, to take yourself off mute and ask. question um could you like uh, just go over briefly about how you make up the um, the pool the uh, make the pool questions uh sure so let me go let me show one of them um yeah so uh, this this was actually oh no that was a recitation one let's see yeah so um so the way that you make these up is in Microsoft Excel, uh, the, there's a very specific format that you have to follow. And uh, I mean, I should, so I should ask Ray to share it um, uh, with you, Yuda, and with everybody. Uh, and, and if you email me, um, I can send you uh, all, uh, a bunch of my work. And actually uh, I can ask Ray if he'd be willing to share his uh, video. I think it's in the e-org for uh, our, department at least. Um, anyway, we can, we can figure out how to do it. But, but basically, if to do this question that I'm showing here, I would type into one cell in Microsoft Excel, how many moles and molecules using Avogadro's number are there in? And then I would use a function called rand between, which finds a random number between say 40 and 80. And then, oh yeah, Nadine just said it's in the eorg. And then I would leave a space so that it could do grams of N2O4. And um, when you upload it, um, 
you actually, the uh, Blackboard reads uh, HTML formatting. So if I want a subscript, I have to do uh, 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 sort of the um, carrots. So open carrot, uh, SUB for subscript, closed carrot. And then on the other side of it, I have to do uh, open carrot backslash sub and then closed carrot um, so that it will do subscripts. And uh, there is a way to get rid of the spaces. Um, uh, yes, uh, Jason, thank you. Uh, the HTML tags, thank you. Um, and uh, so, uh, but then that would be in a separate cell. So I'd have one cell for all of the words right here, then a separate cell for a function that generates a uh, random number of grams. And then uh, you also have a cell in Microsoft uh, Excel over here where you'd put the answer and then a cell for the tolerance. Um, and I usually use two to 5% tolerance for my answers. Uh, and it does plus or minus. So, but then, and then um, you have to save it as a text file and um, Blackboard accepts text file uploads uh, with these specific formats. Uh, and again, I'm happy to, to uh, work more with you, Yuda, or anybody uh, about how to do this. And I'm happy to share uh, example files of, uh, so, because I've got um, the file upload, I've got numeric answers, I've got uh, fib, fill in the blank, I've got fib plus, multiple choice, and multiple answer. So I've got uh, Excel files with all those types of problems that you could model um, your own problems for. Uh, and then of course, uh, beyond that, I've used uh, a bunch, I've learned a lot about HTML too, but about how to do this uh, just from Googling it as well. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And again, please let's, let's talk more about it. Any other questions? Um, we are just at our, about at our time. So um, if you would like to share your email address again one more time in case someone wants to reach out to you, but um, unfortunately you won't be able to take any more questions because we have to get ready for the next session, so. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna just type, so it's MillerWW and I'm typing it into the chat right now at pgcc.edu, there we go. Um, yeah, and so uh, hopefully this will be the beginning of a discussion and I'm happy to share um, uh, any of this and all of this. So, and I will say one other plug, um, at three o'clock, I'm gonna be in the uh, OER um, session. So, uh, and we'll be talking about, uh, so this class is uh, a zero cost class as well. So thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. And thank you, Michelle. All right, you're welcome. All right, have a great day, everybody. Bye -bye. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stick around. So if you have any questions and want to chat or uh, turn on your mic, I'll be here. If that's okay, Michelle. Uh, uh, do we have to free the line, Joseph? Unfortunately, we don't, because this account is uh, slated for session two as well. Okay. okay. We, we will have to clear the line, Bill. Well, that's fine. Uh, then thank you, everybody, and uh, again, follow up uh, via email, and I'm I'm uh, happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good one, Bill. Bye-bye. Good job. Thank you, everybody.